Ice and snow are probably the last building materials you'd think to use to build literally anything outside of igloos and igloo accessories. So it might surprise you to learn that during World War II, the British planned to build the world's largest aircraft carrier out of ice. The fully functional carrier would have been bigger than any other ship ever made, even to this day, and despite being made of ice, was intended to be a real vehicle that could be piloted. It may also surprise you to learn that this was actually a good idea, sort of. In the Second World War, Britain struggled to maintain control of the Atlantic, where German submarines wreaked havoc on Allied ships. The Allies protected their coasts with anti-submarine aircraft, but the limited range of planes of the time left a sizeable gap in the Atlantic where aircraft could not reach the German submarines, which sank countless ships with impunity, leading this area to be known as the Black Pit. An aircraft carrier provided a mobile base for planes to take off and land on, and this helped plug the gaps in the Atlantic's defences. But it was a bit like filling a pothole with diamonds. You know, aircraft carriers aren't exactly cheap, and in war you need to manage your resources across multiple campaigns. Britain in particular, as an island blockaded by Germany, was under immense pressure to source steel and aluminium, which were in short supply. Then English inventor Geoffrey Pike had an idea. Build aircraft carriers out of ice. Now, if you don't believe me, you can try this yourself, but it is much easier to make ice than it is to make steel. With just 1% of the energy used to manufacture steel, you could produce an equivalent mass of ice. If the Allies could solve the problem of the Atlantic gap with ice rather than steel, it would revolutionise their war effort. The British government expressed interest in Pike's idea, and so began Project Habakkuk. The name was a reference to a passage in the book of Habakkuk in the Hebrew Bible. Look at the nations and watch, and be utterly amazed, for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. A very relevant passage for the project, which became more elaborate and unbelievable as it progressed until the final proposal was absolutely ludicrous. It all started with an assessment of the proposed building material. Ice. For reasons that should be obvious, ice isn't exactly ideal for building things. In optimal conditions, ice is very brittle, and when it falls outside of these conditions, which are very easily fallen outside, it literally ceases to exist. Pike discovered using ice to build a military vessel was like using youthful optimism to build a vehicle to propel you along life's trajectory. It dried up long before you were done using it. With the plan fallen at the very first hurdle, it looked like Pike would have to abandon his project, but it was saved by a miraculous invention in 1942. Like ice, concrete and plastic were also brittle, but concrete could be reinforced with steel, and plastic could be embedded with cellulose fibres, which made them much stronger, and it was discovered ice could be similarly strengthened with wood pulp. By mixing 14% wood pulp, 86% water and freezing, you were left with a material that was much harder than ice, melted slower than ice, and was much easier to repair than conventional building materials. Jeffrey Pike adopted this discovery for use in the building of Project Habakkuk, and the wood pulp ice composite became known as Pycrete. Pycrete was stronger than concrete, and in tests against ice, it was shown that a bullet would completely shatter a foot of ice, but became lodged in Pycrete without doing much damage. By this point, the Americans and Canadians were interested in the British project, and they agreed to build a large-scale model ship from Pycrete in Canada to further test the material's capabilities. The prototype was built in Alberta, Canada by conscientious objectors who were not told what it was and called it Noah's Ark. Vital components of the ship were made from conventional materials like wood and steel, and it was all frozen together in Pycrete. The model was 60 feet long, weighed 1,000 tons, and was a pain in the neck to build. Pycrete melted slower than ice, but 
It still melted, which meant the ship had to support a refrigeration system. The model team discovered that the immense size of this meant the ship required much more steel than initially thought, and Pike had to alter plans for the final design. I still haven't told you what the final design was actually supposed to be. This was because it was changed over the lifespan of the project, as the model team informed Pike of changes he would have to make to facilitate the engineering, and the Navy laid down their requirements for performance. By the time Pike had arrived at the project's final design, the requirements had spiralled so out of control that the proposed aircraft carrier had the following specifications. Heavy bombers would have to be able to take off from it, as demanded by the Royal Air Force. This meant the deck had to be at least 600 metres long. This would make the aircraft carrier the largest ship to ever exist. Today, the largest self-propelled ship is the Seawise Giant, measuring in at 458 metres long. Or at least it did before it was scrapped. The Project Habakkuk aircraft carrier had a displacement of 2.2 million tonnes. The Seawise Giant had a displacement of over 600,000 tonnes when fully loaded with cargo. Holding 150 twin-engined bombers, the aircraft carrier was required by the Navy to be torpedo-proof, which meant the hull had to be at least 40 foot thick. The hull held the massive refrigeration system that kept the pikrete from melting, and of course you wouldn't want to put a hot engine in beside it, so there were 26 electric motors mounted to the outside in external nacelles. With 33,000 horsepower, the massive aircraft carrier could move with speeds of up to 6 knots, about 7 miles per hour, meaning the average human could comfortably outrun it. It was supposed to be steered by varying the speed of the motors on either side, but the Royal Navy demanded it have a rudder. The rudder would have been 100 feet tall. Initially, a finished aircraft carrier was envisioned to consume 300,000 tons of wood pulp, 25,000 tons of fireboard insulation, 35,000 tons of timber, and 10,000 tons of steel, and cost around 700,000 pounds to build. In the final design, the refrigeration plant that cooled the ship ended up being so massive that it required more steel to produce than if the ship had just been made of steel to begin with, completely defeating the purpose of the project. They started off with a good idea that became so complicated that their solution ended up being worse than the problem they were trying to solve. The ice ship used more steel than a steel ship. Project Habakkuk was abandoned in 1943, but was its failure the result of unsolvable technical limitations or poor management? Could the idea have survived if its ambitions were scaled back? We'd never know. Advancements in long-range flight and the turning of the Atlantic tide in the Allies' favour outpaced the development of Project Habakkuk, so by the time they should have been going back to the drawing board, there was no need for it. Well, if nothing else came of the project, we at least got Pycrete out of it. And that sounds really practical. So what's been done with that? Nothing. Despite its potential, nobody has figured out how to exploit the properties of Pycrete in any meaningful way beyond concepts that don't see much development. And it remains a scientific curiosity still most associated with Project Habakkuk. Researchers have demonstrated the construction of ice structures by inflating balloons and spraying them with Pycrete. That's nice, I suppose, but, well, it's not as impressive as the other thing, is it? So if your management skills fall somewhere between spraying balloon with liquid and turning the most promising military concept into the world's biggest fridge, then I present you Pycrete, a cheap, sturdy wonder material that no one seems to be using for anything. Get back to me when your business is a success and we'll talk royalties. And check out my other videos for more ingenious ideas. There's so much information in these videos that I'll often have to leave out a bunch of stuff that's only tangentially related, like the fact that one of Project Habakkuk's most fervent proponents was Admiral of the Fleet, Lord Mountbatten, who convinced Winston Churchill of Pycrete's potential by dropping a block of it in Churchill's steaming bath. Mountbatten was famously assassinated by the IRA, who blew up his fishing boat off the coast of Ireland in 1979. You can also subscribe to see my videos in the future as I make them, and you can join the channel membership to support me monetarily and receive a few perks as well. Until next time, stay safe. Jeffrey Pike adopted this discovery for use in the building of Project Habakkuk, and the wood pulp ice composite made me- ah, fuck you. With the plan falling at the very first hurdle, it looked like Hike would have to- uh, hike. It was shown that a bullet would completely... Ah, fuck you. Why do you keep doing this? Oh. 
Get it right, fuck's sake.